of your own, I would recommend. Sorry. Okay, that's no, no, please. Yeah. No, it's, just, it's good to have your own writing space. I, I was going from coffee shop to coffee shop, like a weird, like itinerant writer in Silicon Valley, and like they all knew me. <laughs> they were like, oh, there's that weird writer again, like <laughs> drinking her coffee and like talking to her computer. Um, and then I finally got my own office and was like, look, I can like decorate it and put up maps and talk to myself without anyone looking at me strangely. Um, and now I actually do like you know wear shoes to work. And so. I actually gave the coffee shop where I write all the time a copy of my book when it came out, and they went, oh my god, is that what you were doing? <laughs> <laughs> did you do that so long so they think you were less weird? Or no, you know, I went there and I put up um, flyers for my launch, and nice. I was yeah. like, do you want to come? Do you want to come to my launch? I'm having lunch because I wrote a book, but that was the thing I was doing, and they were like, good, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, questions? Um, book two is going to be out on August 30th of this year. Um, I am turning in my edits on Monday, which these lovely people have gotten to witness because I'm like, I don't have my edits, what? What cheer do you want? They're lovely. I'll try not to distract. Yeah, we're not very I have to get my hands on Glass Sword. It was great. Guys, go to Target. <laughs> Buy the book. Well, I, I shouldn't say get my hands on it. Like, have time to read it, which will probably be in May. I not only love it because it's just a highly and really well and it's really well thought out. And like she clearly like loved it. But Kirsten, you know, wrote very like funny, lighter, paranormal way for a while. I don't know, there's just there was something that's really cool to me about seeing an author friend like take this sort of a bold risk and be like, No, I'm doing this like this giant historical book about Blobby and Taylor, except that it's Blada, not Blah now. And um, and I just I loved it and it's a really great book. Yeah, I'm the same. Yeah, and that's that is good for me emotionally and for my brain. It's, yeah, it's hard to write YA, particularly like if you are a yeah. specific genre. Like if you're a contempt, it's hard to write YA contempt while reading it. So I, if I read YA, I mostly read I mostly read contempt. Yeah, because I, I don't want anybody else's voice in my head. So I, I read a ton of nonfiction. I read a ton of mysteries. Um, I don't know romance novels. I love historical romance. Yeah, like, Regency romance. Good yeah. stuff. This is so not worth the build up now. I mean, like, <laughs> no, I was just going to say I'm the opposite and I have to be to be reading something while I'm writing it because if I'm putting out words, I need to be taking them in as well. Otherwise, I just I just can't. And that, I think that was one of the reasons that I struggled a lot last year because I was doing a full time job and I was editing a book on deadline for the first time. And because I read my own book roughly 35 times to edit it, not because I was like, oh my god, this is so great, I just finished it, let's read it again. Um, I only probably read about 10 books last year, um, maybe, a, maybe a little bit more. I kept like reading picture books and then counting them on my Goodreads <laughs> counter before I would like give them to my like two-year-old nephew. Um, not nephew, uh, whatever. Anyway, um, but um, best two books uh, that I read last year was um, one of the ones that just came out this year was the the girl from everywhere by Heidi Haley because that was amazing and then um, I will also pimp which I did last night the Winner's Kiss which is the third in the Winner's Curse trilogy which comes out on Tuesday. Oh, yeah. who, who do you want to pimp? Okay. Um, 
Two, two. One is um, the sequel to The Wrath and the Dawn. It's called The Rose and the Dagger. It is so good. You are not mentally prepared. Trust me, it's just the best book. Um, and the second is um, Salt to the Sea by Ruta Sapetis. Yes. So, so good. You know, yes, and it, it kills me because I feel like Ruta and I are pretty much soulmates and meant to be. She doesn't know this. Um, but, um, but yeah. She's so nice. She's really nice because I sent her this email after I finished the book that was so embarrassing. I was like, I love you in your book also, but I love you. And she actually still, like, she responded. She didn't get, she didn't run away. That was really nice. That's me. The day I meet Ruta, the world will explode. It'll be yeah. great. Like that's pretty much what happens. Really I think everything's going to be better. I went to Atlanta two weeks ago in Arizona, and I just like almost dropped my drink. I was like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to be taking notes right now. <laughs> basically, when I world build, it's basically about worry warning, but also um, for Dove Rising and Dove Exiled, I've spent a lot of time on the NASA website. I um, I researched the craters that I put the bases in. So, for example, base four is sort of equatorial, and base one is by the North Pole. So sometimes it just has like light all all the time, like. And I know how long the day is on the moon, and like I figured out how you would get the, you know, how people would breathe and like what they would eat. And the only thing I messed around with was gravity. So when I was in senior year taking a physics class, my physics tutor showed me this video on YouTube of a frog levitating because it had this 10 peg electromagnet around it. So I was like, whoa, 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 what if you put that above people's heads? So the moon has one sixth the gravitational force of the Earth, right? So if you put people up there, they would just bounce like going around. But so how do you keep that from happening? Um, you just stick the giant magnets above their heads, and it repels the water in our bodies to like stick us to the ground. But that doesn't actually work. It would probably kill you. <clears throat> and I never said how many Teslas are running through that electromagnet, and I really don't want to know. I feel for, for me, world building is a lot of like making very conscious choices, and but then trying to make them seem natural. 
um, because it's you, you may start from like mine as Wild West and Theory of Good Night, so that was deciding what I was going to bring in from each. But also you have to because you're building a new, if you're building a new world, you have to decide like really dumb things like what you're going to call things. So, like you know if um, are you if you're going to use I remember something where someone drank it was specifically called champagne in a in a fictional world and i remember thinking oh but the region of champagne doesn't exist in your fictional world and that but you could say the same like if something was magenta and burgundy like those are both colors named after regions so it's like a very conscious choice of whether you want to include that or not and everything is like a touchstone in our real world um so like when i was i had a real struggle with what i was going to call Places of worship, um, you know, because they're not churches, they're not temples, they're not mosques, they're it's own, its own religion. So, you know, having to make a very conscious choice to name these things, to, to separate them from our world, but also, you know, make it seem natural, make it seem like you haven't just, you know, made up eighteen thousand words and really confuse everyone. So, I think you need to have enough touchstones of our world so that it's a little bit familiar, so that people are kind of clicking their mind, like, okay, this is sort of medieval England. Or this is sort of, you know, blah, blah, but, you know, have a clear thing that this makes it distinct from our world. So that would be. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I struggled with one of my characters because he's a warrior and I'm not a warrior. And so I found that going out and interviewing warriors was very helpful for me. Um, I recommend that if you're stuck with a character and they're different from you, um, there's something that you're not familiar with, um, or if you're interested in writing a character uh, because, you know, whatever, you always thought that, I don't know, um, scientists are super cool and you want to write a kid who wants to be a scientist or whatever. Um, that's totally why I thought of it, actually, because um, you're super cool. Um, then, you know, and you don't, don't know anything about it, then, then research it because it'll, it'll fill your head with ideas. And, and I, I personally feel the best type of research is person to person. I learned more from interviewing a police officer and an FBI agent um, and a, a soldier and a West Point cadet than I would ever have learned if I had spent hours researching those things online. Because I, I took things that they said and things that they did and put that into my character and that's what made him real. So, uh, so basically research is, is my recommendation. Also to build off that, just observing people, we're all so different and just like watching the way you, you I don't know, you know, your cab driver like walks or something, you know, from sitting all day in the car, like how is he, how is he different? And, like how many people has he talked to? What has he learned? Just, and just asking yourself questions about people that you meet can really help build your sympathy toward them as an author. And, uh, and uh, also thinking about motivation of people. You know, when, you, when someone does something, think about you know, why, why would they do that? Uh, and start thinking about the kind of uh, way people are operating in the, in the world. Um, I also have a, a, an exercise I do for myself when I start a, a novel, which is to create a cause and causal method. And I think of three events